Hello, my name is Deborah Barkin and I am Creative Director of the Berman Museum of Art and Curator of the exhibition Chuck Kelton Folds. And I'm here to introduce you to the artist Chuck Kelton and to his work. Chuck Kelton is an artist, he's also a master printer. He prints for top museums and galleries and artists, which means that he is an expert in precision, precision in timing, in temperature, and in chemistry that's necessary for making impeccable prints. It's particularly notable that in his own artistic practice, Kelton chooses to make cameraless photographs in full daylight using darkroom chemistry and metals, a complete break with the darkroom printing process. Yet, as the work demonstrates, the mastery of the medium is still in evidence when one sees the rich and evocative effects that the artist attains through his use of chemistry. The exhibition takes its title, Folds, from the signature crease that the artist places in the work. The act of folding or creasing the paper violates the sanctity of the photosensitive surface and in essence fractures the photosensitive emulsion that is what generally gives photography its illusory effects. The idea for this series came from an experience the artist had when a client returned a print to him precisely because it had a crack or a crease in it that wasn't meant to be there. And in inspecting the returned print, Kelton saw in that crease, saw in that fold, something beautiful. And he began to experiment with this act of folding the paper until he arrived at this horizontal line which materializes into a horizon line onto a fictive landscape. Now what makes this a fictive landscape? Uh, there is, in Kelton's photography, no window. And his title for this series, A View Not From a Window, references what's believed to be, by many, the first camera photograph, a work by the inventor Joseph Niesiform Yeps that he entitled view from the window at Le Gras, which was a view outside of Nieps's studio into the rural French countryside. In that case, Nieps is intentionally attempting to get the view outside of his studio window. In the case of Kelton's work, there is no window beyond the window of the print itself. These works aren't um, referencing a referent in the observable world, but rather what we see is the result of Kelton's chemical experiments on a print that he's worked sometimes for weeks, sometimes for months, using photographic chemistry and metals suspended in solution. So that what we see as a particularly turbulent, stormy landscape, or what we see as a very austere, subtle, motionless landscape is really the result of the viewer perceiving the fold as a horizon line, which then creates a kind of spatial dimensionality and allows us to perceive depth in the image. I think one of the ways that we are accustomed to thinking about photography is this sort of myth of photographic truth the idea that for every photograph there's necessarily um, a referent in the observable world that necessarily correlates there. And I think that what Kelton's work does is troubles that notion. So when we look at this print, for instance, we can see the, the depths of the ocean and we can see the swirl of clouds and what we can see as, as the spray of the waves or the rush of the wind. And what we have to remind ourselves is in fact there is no referent that the landscape that we're seeing is a landscape of the mind that's been conjured through the manipulation of photographic chemistry and through the manipulation of metals. And so I think what this introduces is this notion that troubles our assumption of photography and truth. What we're seeing is a kind of inner landscape. What's being communicated is a kind of an emotional landscape. And when one looks at his prints, it begins to conjure the landscape
landscapes of Constable or of Turner, the composite landscapes of Gustave Le Gray, or even something like the paintings of Motherwell, works by Richard Serra, where you have a kind of uh, material patina effect that you get, or even some of the kind of violent images you get in a Francis Bacon painting. Some of the tonal effects that you get that begin to suggest 19th century or early 20th century photography come from the chemical formulations that Kelton employs and these he often takes from his collection of 19th and early 20th century photographic manuals. And when we think of photography today, we tend to think of a process that captures in an instant, right, the clicking of the shutter, that captures an instant in time in the observable world. And in fact, these um, prints suggest that what Kelton has captured is a moment of turbulence, a moment of stillness, a moment in some kind of natural effect. But in fact, these prints are worked and worked and worked, sometimes for weeks. And he thinks about this practice of making his prints um, as a kind of theater or a kind of performance. And he's likened it to um, applying calligraphy with photographic chemistry. So he approaches each one of these prints in three acts. The first act would be the creasing of the paper, the making of the fold. The second act would be the manipulation of the bottom, the area beneath the fold. And the third act, the top of the print or the area above the fold. Now, all of these begin with a process of sketching, and that process of sketching can sometimes take weeks before Kelton ever approaches the photosensitive paper. As he goes through these three initial acts, he puts the paper aside. He folds the paper, he lets it sit. He manipulates the lower part of the print, he lets it sit, he lets it dry. He then goes and uh, manipulates the top of the print, lets it sit, lets it dry. Then he goes back and he begins to work the print. And this is something that can unfold over a number of weeks, where he, in a sense, is working in a kind of push and pull process with the photographic chemistry. He'll go in with bleach, for instance, to lighten areas. He'll go back in then with developer to make areas darker. He'll then introduce metals such as selenium, gold chloride, or iron to produce color in the print. This process can sometimes take weeks, and when he's deemed that it is complete, he sets it aside, he numbers it right away, and then he puts it away. And only later can he sort of come back and approach the print and begin to unpack what for him was really an intuitive process. He thinks about this as a kind of diaristic gesture. And this series now has approximately 500 works in it. You'll see about 37 of them on display here in the gallery. And when Kelton looks at each of these prints, he gets a sense just by looking uh, when this print may have been made over this 10 year period that he has been producing this still ongoing series. So he can look, for instance, at a print and say, oh, that's 2014, or that's 2017, or this is 2014. So they are a very diaristic, emotional impression of what's going on in the artist's life. And while they may not tell that story, they may not relay that narrative to a viewer. The kind of emotional intensity that they do relay to a viewer, I think, communicates or evokes a certain kind of emotional response. In this vitrine, we have a number of examples of the artist's sketchbooks. Chuck Kelton is an artist who draws and sketches continuously. So in the course of a year, he may fill two to three of these sketchbooks. And in this particular case, we can see a number of his sketches for works that become part of the Fold series. But we also see 
his collection of postcards, postcards of works of art, photographs that he's taken himself. In this particular example, we see a copy of Joseph Turner's The Fifth Plague of Egypt from 1800. And we begin to see the relationship between the intensity of the examples, the kind of research that lays the groundwork for the View Not From a Window series. In addition, in this vitrine, we see a number of his earliest experiments with the horizontal fold and the way that he begins to play with the cracking of the photo emulsion surface and the kind of textural differentiation that the fold gives and the kind of depth that what is really seen as a transgressive act in photography, the folding of photographic paper, becomes material and becomes illusory and becomes dimensional. In this vitrine, we see some of the examples of Kelton's collections of 19th and early 20th century photography manuals and some of the formulations that he uses in his photographs, some of the chemical formulations and some of the metals that he uses to bond with the silver emulsion, he takes from these historical materials, which is what gives some of the photographs these tonal values that are suggestive of 19th century and early 20th century photography. So even though he's not working in the dark room, even though he's working in daylight, his photographs conjure these references or make these references to earlier photographic processes, historic processes. Kelton is also in love with what he calls the stuff of photography, and by that he means analog photography, the stuff of the dark room. So we see in here vials and measuring implements for measuring darkroom chemistry. We see a vial of gold chloride. We see an envelope of photographic paper, a funnel, jars of chemistry, a mercury thermometer, all of these implements associated with darkroom photography so that when Kelton is measuring his chemistry for this series, he will use a mercury thermometer. So if he's making uh, masterworks for another artist or museum, he'll rely on digital thermometers and digital timing devices. But when he's making his own work, he is relying on these slightly less precise, though more historic tools associated with the darkroom. Kelton's work pulls in such a broad array of references, whether we're talking about art historical references, um, historical process photography, painting, drawing, or we're talking about issues having to do with truth and representation and abstraction and the kind of tensions and push and pull between abstraction and representation. Whether we're thinking about art and science and the way that photography, even cameraless photography, is beholden to chemistry, is beholden to science and the study of light and physics, Chuck Kelton's exhibition Fold really has broad appeal for anyone with those kind of intersections of interdisciplinary thought. Thank you for watching this preview of the exhibition, and if you'd like to see more, please check out the virtual tour on the Berman Museum website, where you can also find high-resolution images of each work on view. Thank you.